All right, guys. Um, so this is our first kind of um, fellow-driven CAF conference. Um, we're going to present the. We're going to kind of keep the same format for the next um, for the next one, but this is kind of our pilot program right here. Um, we're going to have four cases presented by four teams, comprising three fellows at different levels, and then we're going to um, chime in. Um, in terms of kind of mining to see what where the deficiency knowledge is um, in, in terms of the CAF realm. I um, know for the first year you really act, don't have much um, exposure to the lab, but again, this, there are no dumb questions. You know, um, this is an open format, and we thank Dr. Sarkar um, for coming here to kind of moderate um, the session. And um, again, this is all about learning. And again, uh, feel free to come to the lab when we have any case or anything like that to you know to improve your your knowledge or anything like that. And again. Questions are, are more than welcome. So we'll start with our first case. Uh, I'm Bashar, one of the first year fellows. And the first case is a 55-year-old female with no past medical history uh, who presented to the hospital as an outside transfer uh, for evaluation of shortness of breath and new onset uh, heart failure. So she was diagnosed with a PE uh, five days prior to admission. And at the same time, she was found to have a new onset heart failure systolic with an EF less than 20%. And uh, that's why she was transferred uh, for further workup and management. Uh, when she first came to the hospital, she was just complaining of shortness of breath. At, this, at that time, when she had a PE, she was complaining of chest pain fluoritic. Uh, when she came in, her vital signs were stable. Uh, she was not in overt heart failure. She had no S3, no JBD and her chest was clear to auscultation. She had no lower CBD edema. Um, her EKG at baseline showed left bundle branch block. Uh, echo initially showed a depressed EF, at less than 20%, with severely enlarged LV and normal RV function. Uh, she had a mild MR. So the patient was taken to right heart catheterization. I have uh, the films. So her PA uh, pressure was 50, uh, systolic over 30 with a mean 25. Uh, her wedge pressure is, was around 10. And this is her RPA pressure. And this is aortic pressure. So her uh, cardiac output was uh, 4.72, and her cardiac index was 2.63. Uh, she had a transpulmonary gradient of uh, 15, and a PVR of 3.33. Now left heart catheterization. I can find it. So we're looking at uh, the left system in a LA or cranial shot and show a patent LAD and patent circumflex. This is another, uh, yeah, go back. No, no, faster with this part because it's not our focus. I mean okay, and uh, this is our RA cranial, also normal. And uh, this RCA was also normal. So patient after her uh, right heart catheterization, she went into a uh, complete heart block. After or during her work? After the right heart catheterization. Can, can you put or the report the actual numbers of the right heart cath as were reported? The... I thought numbers. I mean, I have it here on you have it me, here. You but... Said you can show the actual numbers that they have. Just put it up. What was the systolic, pulmonary artery systolic pressure? Uh, 50, 50 over 13, Okay. with a mean of 15, with, with a mean of 25. No, no, no. The initial mean was 90. 
Okay, so the report was. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, just to, just one thing, one point from this is the report was 15 systolic, uh, 10, 10 13, diastolic, 13, 13 diastolic, and, uh, and the mean was 19. Okay, so if you read that, you're going to, that was the report, uh, actually, you go to the precision documentation file, it's, there's there those numbers. And this happens to all of us, we all, happens to us. We put numbers, just be sure that we're putting accurate numbers, especially the mean. Be sure to double check the mean. When you calculate the mean, by the initial formula, you come up with a pressure mean, pulmonary arterial pressure of 25, which is not normal. It's mildly elevated, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing is, if you go by, by that, with 25, and you calculate, you, we, you calculate the TPG is elevated. And if you calculate the uh, PDR is 3.3, mildly elevated. But again, from a normal hemodynamic profile, you, part, you, we, you turn out to be mild pulmonary hypertension, probably pre-capillary with a elevated PDR. Okay, just by looking at the numbers. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, so that's one of the measures. Now, what happened during the gap? But, well, if you, if you admit, what, can you go back to the PA tracing and show us how you get? I mean, so obviously, 11, 11 times Q plus. Yeah. If you do the two-thirds systolic and one-third diastolic, that gives you the yeah. 25, right? Yeah, that's this, is a, this is an actual mean, though, right here. Isn't this an actual mean, the, the mean that No, you're that's using? the electrical mean. Uh, I, I guess what's the difference between the triple mean and, and For me, Rob, the first thing that you have to pay attention when you're, you're looking at these things is that if you're having a, a RB systolic pressure in the absence of the stenosis that is around 49, something's going wrong. I mean, the normal resting PA pressure is around systolic, it's around 25, okay? So that's, I, I think this is not to a particular patient, but just, I think that's, we can move. You can. You, we can argue about the tracing and the variable calibration, but I think that's the focus. Well, this. I guess this. Go, go to the RB. Twenty-five to thirty. This would be twenty-five to thirty. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. But why is it calling eighteen? So the numbers yeah. are wrong here. So something. that's one of the things. I. I think just. I'm saying when you look at the big pictures, pay attention to the numbers. Pay attention to that makes sense. If you have a PA systolic of fifty, I don't think it's going to be. It's very. It's going to be very unusual to have a normal mean because you're having an elevated PA story. So let's, what happened in, during the gap? Yeah, it was, sorry? I said, but by those tracings, the PA is not really I think when you go to the RB story, uh, I, and that's one of the things of calibration and things, they look, if you go to the RB, you can show the RB. I mean, I, I think that's, well, maybe it's, I know what it's about. Let's go to the RB. Uh, you, you know, I think something, you know, okay. but I think the bottom line is that. It's not to, I think it's not yeah, to discuss no, the perfect. I think point, point is valid that your number should make sense when you come to the cash position laboratory, and especially in a lady with a new idea of carrying off with the nervous show of etiology. Um, you have to make sure we, we have, you know, accurate numbers. You know. Very good. So, that's so and, and then. This is also heart block at 50. Uh, let's so go. That's gonna be, no, no, that's what? Gonna be a no, 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 no. That's, gonna that's be a higher complication. Yeah. So right. let's put no, the base net. The RPSP is gonna be higher because it's yeah. more filling time. Yeah, but right. let me, let me, let me let's go to the baseline EKG, please. I, I didn't scan the baseline EKG. Okay. It was so like left bundle what, branch what, block. That's what's important. So she had a left bundle <laughs> branch block. Okay. At baseline. Okay. So at baseline. That's one thing. So by having a left bundle, second thing is. Left under branch blocks, where you see a lot of patients with cardiomyopathy here that come for right heart cut commonly. So around 5% of the patients that are going to serious are going to develop right under branch block. So in the setting of left under branch block, you have to be alert to a possible complication related to messing with the uh, right band. Okay? But, and the third thing where, let's look at this EKG. It's, it's okay, no? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Tell me, what do you see? Who wants to to comment on the EKG? So just by looking at it, it looks like you have P waves marching through, and you probably have a particular escape rhythm, given the fact that there's not. Yeah. Not so, 
don't know if it's perfectly lined up with those keys. Or Perfect. Something. So you're seeing more keys than in QRSS complexes, right. basically. Right. Okay, and the QRSS complexes, I know, uh, like on the lower side of the heart rate, heart, well, it's worse than heart rate because we don't have the thing, but I, I imagine around 40. Yeah, the fact that it's so wide. How much? 30, 35. Okay, so let's. And this uh, thing is more repeating, uh, but I think uh, when I was reflecting about this and we were seeing that this EKG is, the thing is, remember, paroxysmal AD block, basically two mechanisms. So I want to be, and this <coughs> is going to be, we got the simple way is to say, you mess with the red bundle and you cause it a block. Okay, that would be, but why your heart rate? Your actual heart rate is fast. So on the faster side, around 100. So just remember, not all paroxysmal AV blocks are the same. One thing is you can have tachycardia dependent paroxysmal AV blocks, and this seems to be the case. And um, I think Moisés said you're going to be much better than myself. But the, let's see if paroxysmal AV blocks are going to be post dependent and uh, tachycardia dependent AV blocks. And the mechanism of this is basically you have a sick heart because a patient with cardiomyopathy, the patient, you, by pulling the catheter, and this has also been reported, you can trigger actual arrhythmias, and the fast actual arrhythmia is not given time for the myocardium to recover, and the his bundle to recover and come down. So I think the mechanism in these patients can be a tachycardia dependent AB block, paroxysmal. Okay, so that's why I'm seeing here, I think, just to keep in mind, uh, it's not that I, I want, but that's the, the third point of which is the mechanism that we think we what happened in this patient. So that's the third point. Um, any questions with that? I think you're seeing this thing. You're, you're, what I'm paying, uh, just pointing out is you're not having like this sinus wave, typical sinus wave P, and then it goes to block because you mess with the right bundle and cause the block. Most likely, you have an uh, actual supraventricular, like actual tachycardia, and this fast that causes a tachycardia dependent paroxysmal AV block. I think that's a mechanism. Why? It's why? Why? Because it's upright in V2. It's what? Like the P wave is upright and V2 looks like a normal P wave. Why yes. are you saying it's not a, why are you saying it's a supraventricular? What, what, I, what I, I mean, Rob, is like the patient heart rate baseline, where we have reported, is around 70. It was not tachycardic. She went. Uh, during the cut, went to AV block. You're seeing if you have AV block because you mess with the bundle, you don't have to increase the heart rate. I'm not saying that that's a mechanism if it's an actual arrhythmia, but I'm saying the supraventricular arrhythmia maybe it's fast enough that it's causing the, the refractoriness of, of the uh, his, his. Yeah. So you would suggest treating this patient with a beta no, uh, removing the catheter next no. time. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's my suggestion. But if one tries to do experimental medicine, I'm not opposing it. Okay. So, uh, you're going to cap the fishing at hemodynamical stable and sharpen Um. I think that she was stuck on dopamine. She was sent to the ICU. Yeah, we and, um, okay. and she was. Yeah, I think the thing here is, I think the first thing is to remove the catheter and take it from there. I, I mean, that's what we're going to do, I mean. And I think the thing is that you start doing things that something's going to work, but you don't know how it works. Okay. Uh, so, that's the thing. Well, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. If it wasn't when you, stable. Were, when you remove the catheter, was the I, patient I think, I think no. How much you were in the procedure? No, no, yeah. Yeah, she was an unstable. She, she was, was unstable. Her blood pressure was okay. I, I think that's... Sorry? Yeah, keep Not me out right. of this. <laughs> I'm on T1. I can't help you. Yeah, but you were there. What? Because her heart rate was like down to like 30s, 25, 35. So I agree your point. Uh, so I said it's the same point that Nick was pointing out. It's what has happened. If it's that kind of temperature, it should be getting worse. I, mean, I think this was triggered by some mechanical thing. But I, I just think it's more important to think a little <laughs> more of what is maybe the mechanism. That to be think, all through 100% because I, I don't think I'm going to be 100% patient heart rate was 25. So yeah. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you have to do something. How do you prevent this? Like, is there something like wise? So I think from the prevention standpoint, I think the, the lessons are if you are going to do a right attack in a patient with a left bundle, 
branch clots, we alert that around 5% of those patients may get right on the branch. And if your patient already had a left bundle, they can have an AV block. In that case, what can you do is that things that one thing is, and I think we don't do it, so I, I, I just, we have, obviously in our catalog, we have a transcutaneous pacer. We, we can be prepared with a pacer in the room, like a, a have the pacemaker a wire and the, and the pacemaker box there. So we can have those things, and we already have an access so I think it's really fast. We can, if you have it there, if, I think that's the key. If you're asking me prevention, I would have a pacemaker wire in the room and a, uh, the pacemaker generator there, in case you need it. The only thing I could think of that technique because I went really fast. No, no, no. I don't think no, no, no. I could so that's well, I was going to ask you is, is about technique, because I don't know if you saw anything. I don't know the answer to this. Is this like more likely to happen if you're going femoral versus live? No, I didn't because see that. Kind of they muck around what a they, bit more what they're, they're pointing out is some centers to try to prevent this. They do that, this, and the fluoroscopic guidance, and what we, we do it here. So I, I didn't see any added value of the yeah, recommendation. The point is, especially if you're going to do a bedside procedure on a patient with a baseline as well, um, you know, that's okay. yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, you think twice about doing a bed overnight bedside procedure on a patient with a baseline as well. Even a hygiene. Just be cognizant of this, you know, this can be a, uh, a complication. And the, I think the last point is going to be this patient five days prior to catheterization was diagnosed with a P. So the question here is patient back cardiomyopathy, you are concerned about coronary heart disease. We know that coronary heart disease is the number one cause of cardiomyopathy. This here in the United States, and you are doing a coronary angiography. Okay. What is the the thing here is we're going to s assess if you're good. We, we can have the LBDP, okay, from the, the left heart catheterization. The thing here is what are the indications why to do this procedure? And uh, this is not a, I, I didn't. In the guidelines, <coughs> obviously, at least in an acute setting or subacute setting, there's nothing for right heart catheterization in the Unless you're thinking of thrombolytic directed therapy, and I'll give you. And the right ventricular function was the EF by MRI was 47. So, what I'm trying to say is just we, we, we need to reflect on this, and I think not to have the right answer, and I, I don't believe it's just always, we have our personal feelings, but it's said, what would have changed in our management, how the information for right heart cath would have added in our prognostic evaluation, and I think that's, uh, that's the, the last thing I want to talk. We all know, and that has been reported, that patients with heart failure that had a PE had higher mortality than patients PE without heart failure, like almost out. But the use of right heart catheterization in this setting, at least, I think, needs part evaluation. So I think. All right. So we have. For she was a 77-year-old um, female um, with past medical history of. CAD, stats post, uh, stints to the RCA uh, one year ago, who presented back to clinic with um, <coughs> basically increasing frequency of anginal symptoms with associated shortness of breath, um, as well as uh, kind of marginally controlled hypertension. Um, other past medical history, she's a former smoker, no other surgeries. Um, no other medical issues. She's been appropriately medically treated. She's on dual antiplatelet, metoprolol, uh, extended release, and simvastatin, 20 milligrams. So she was referred to CATH, um, and she underwent CATH in October. This is well, this is her baseline EKG. Pretty unremarkable for 
evaluation just technicality. I think the meat of our presentation will come from reviewing the CAF. Um, someone want to, well, I can go through the cath or if someone wants to walk, someone wants to kind of walk through it with me or what do you guys want? Rob, you want to go through the cath? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me when you want, when you want to, when you got everything out, you're out of it and you want me to switch to the next, uh, uh next frame? So it's Elliot Crane, so the LED is going to be coming, uh, kind of straight down. It's a, it's a hard cath because of the I think the diameter of the vessels. We could pause it too if you like. I think this shows the anatomy very well. So the circ is small, yeah. right? Unless that's you're going to call that OM. I, I think it's a circ, OM, and LED. That's what I would say if you go from left. So that ramus or high OM? Yeah. yeah. And there's a small circumflex, probably distal circumflex is totally gone. There's a small branch that descends and probably goes into the LPL territory. Now come to the LED, AP cranial. You want AP cranial? There must be an areocranial or an apical. There you go. Okay, now try to go to the apex. <laughs> <coughs> so they're very aggressive with this. I mean, but I still, I, I think in this view, it doesn't open up. You're concerned about the ostium. It doesn't open the ostium very well. No. Is there an LED after the ostium? It is, and there is an LED. It looks a little lumpy-bumpy. 
that and there's it's, no it's term, there's no term called lumpy bumpy okay there are some lunar irregularities but you see a bifurcating led there is no dyad this is a bifurcating led why is it a bifurcating led because it just it goes right away it branches off like that i just feel is like is there septals coming off the other branch also go but board let's do no that's just play are you play You want to see? You want to see LAO See where the LED is in this next picture, please. LAO cranium. Uh, the next one is an LAO cranium, but you want LAO cranium? LAO cranium. I mean, I see separate something coming off of this going in this but direction. That's not the LED. That's that's the LED. Yeah. There is a branch which you see. So after the mid LED, there is this bifurcating two branches. Yeah. Like a dual LED system, you call it. Uh, okay, next. We reviewed that one already. So the longest branch is. And the one from it, you see it, you see a large septal coming off that LED, correct? Right. So then you track this, and the one that reaches the apex is your true LED. Now you can call this like a but dual LED, LED system, but I would still call the second branch as a diagonal because. But it does look the one, the one, the one that it. reaches almost to the apex, or the apex is the LED. So you're calling this the diagonal here, or? No, 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 no. no, no. Down further. Down this one. So this is the septal, mm -hmm. and then you just trace the main branch all the way down. There you go. Oops. So that's the septal. And then the yeah, one right to your right is the LED. This is the LED? No, no, no. Oh, that's the, the one. Diagonal. That's the diagonal. Yeah. So that is that second branch that you were seeing oh, left with the ring. This is the septal. It is a diagonal. They're saying do Because it comes off the LED. LED. So the elio cordal is the best shot <coughs> to determine <coughs> Septal, LED, diagonal, ramus, circ. So like a fan, you will see five branches in that order. And you don't have to fiddle through the entire angiogram to know which is what. Right. If you start with the LAO cordal, <coughs> go to the RAO cordal so you know the circ and the high OM, get it out of the way, and just concentrate then what are the three branches I'm seeing. So if you want to go back again, we can go back to the earlier cordal and decide. Yeah, let's go back. Let's go back to the earlier. I know it's a little basic, but probably you know for the junior fellows it will be helpful. So instead of jumping on an angiogram and trying to <coughs> guess, this is very simple, very intuitive. You see five branches. The smallest one to the extreme left. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Is a septal. Then the LED diagonal. This and then far after that is that ramus or a high OM, depending on whether it comes from the left vein or the cert, and then the finally the cert. So you know which branches you need to trace. Okay, all right. Please carry on. Okay, so I guess we've done the anatomy of it, but I think we need, still need to review it for disease. Okay, so anybody wants to volunteer? I mean, it's not a very good injection. I mean, I think these images are so, was there an intervention here? Yes. That's Maybe the dye pictures will be better because you get more dye. Uh, but we do see, obviously, a very uh, significant lesion in the osteal LED and osteal ramus. Or osteo, not LED. Osteo is uh, osteo or LED and diag. Diag. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Osteo LED and osteo diag. Let's look at the right. Okay, so this is the right. Luminal irregularities there. Okay. So I know that for with some of you, I have I've gone over it, but again, please describe the RCA. Josh, if you remember the pain. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, please describe the segments of the RC. So there's the proximal segment, which extends from the ostium to the RV branch. The mid segment span extends from the RV branch to the acute marginal. The distal extends from the acute marginal to the takeoff of the PD. The PD itself is a, I guess, a branch. Four segments. So surgically, RC is divided into four segments. Proximal RCA is from the ostium of the RCA to the first RV branches. Now in this case, we don't have a very big AM, but generally from the RV branch to the AM branch is the mid segment. And from the takeoff of the AM to the crux, where the bifurcation happens, is the distal RCA. And PDA itself is the... Where is classically the AM? AM is right where you have the C loop. So that is the actual margin of the heart. So that's where the AM comes off. On the obtuse margin of the heart is an obtuse margin, and the acute margin is the acute margin. The large branch, which will almost look like parallel to the PDA most of the time. In this patient, unfortunately, we don't have a very big, but in this case, then I would use right where the RCA turns and dives back. That is the acute margin. Think that's here. where the branch will come. And the fourth segment of the RCA is the PDA. Now the other branch, some people, describe it as just PL branches. That is technically not right, because first of all, it's an AV continuation branch, and that gives off the RPL branches. So if you have to describe the RCA, describe the four segments, and then describe you know, the AV continuation with its PL branches. So that will tell you if the circ is going to be you know, a significant vessel, supplying the lateral wall, or most of the stuff is coming from the right side, okay? Carry on, please. So, um, you want to go, th okay. It's in the shot of the right, it's a trichelogram. Looks pretty no normal. Uh, so, this is where we start getting into more diagnostics, which is kind of the crux of our presentation. Um, but I think it's important that we identify the disease then prior to us going through that. So. I think if you're looking at, I think this kind of lays out the disease the best, or one of these shots here. So the disease that you know they were most concerned about is here, and what I believe to be the LED coming down here. They felt that there was a lesion here, of probably intermediate significance, and also some in the first diagonal. So when you do angiogram, you should talk in numbers. You know. Do you think this is beyond 70% or angiographically significant stenosis mm -hmm. or between 50 and 70% mm -hmm. angiographically intermediate or and you know non-obstructive CAD less than 50% right. or 30 to 50, whatever you want to call it? So if I had to rate, I would say that this lesion here is probably 50 to 70% somewhere in there. And okay. same thing with the diagonal lesions. Okay. okay. So and then you guys did an FFR? They proceeded to FFR. Um, I mean, do you want to see the images of the FFR wires going down, or do you want so to see the, the tracing? What's the teaching uh, point here? What what message are you trying to uh, convey? What is like last case was you know EKG abnormality, right? Catheter manipulation. Right. So in this lady with typical chest pain and intermediate lesions, um, confirmation of ischemia, um, like we've learned through. And you know a uh, physiological assessment of ischemia is probably going to help. Well, improve your outcomes, a better drive your ischemia, or your better drive your vascular addition. They're going to learn that from the FAME trials. Um, so I think that's. I think I've probably done one, maybe seen one. So FFR is done uh, with uh, pressure catheters where you compare uh, the pressure distal to 
um, your stenosis with the mean aortic pressure. Um, and so the original trial, or one of the original trials was done, um, published in the New England Journal, um, and basically what they did was they, they had patients with inducible ischemia based on non-invasive uh, measures such as uh, exercise stress or thallium-based stress, and in those patients they were able to identify that there was in the mean aortic, mean pressure drop um, uh, across the stenosis, if it was greater than 0.75%, correlated with significant disease. Point. During maximal hyperemia. Using adenosine. Yeah, that's the So. Pressure wire, sorry. Pressure wire. The key point there is that so we can use the, uh, the aortic pressure is measured in the normal way we can use the column of, uh, of uh, saline uh, at the tip of the, the guide to get the aortic uh, pressure, but the distal pressure, just so as to not, because initially in the first, uh, you know, when the FFR was first developed, it was measured with uh, microcatheters, distal to the di uh, distal to the stenosis, but that amount of stenosis that is caused by the catheter would then qualify by the FFR. So now it's not like a pressure transducer that is on the tip, but within the wire itself. So for everyone, can you actually show us a pressure wire, what do we look like on that ceiling? Uh, sure. I just want to make sure everybody sees one. I'm assuming that's one. So that's the pressure wire going in, right? Austin, or this might be an IBIS. I don't know. I, can, I yeah, got another difference. Okay. Go, go back a couple of frames. So. There you go. So that's just a wire, right? It just looks like that's a regular horny wire. There's nothing fancy, fancy about that. Are you going to show us some waveforms? Like yeah, I have the waveforms here. They're just a little that? sideways. I have So this is what I guess is only generated. Um, it makes so much more sense when it's in color. It's color coded, yeah. Yeah. So basically, you're I have you're reviewing the mean pressure across the stenosis compared to your aortic pressure, and some people use a cutoff. I think the original paper was 0.75. Some people use 0.8. I think those are usually the two generally accepted values. And if you have something below that, then it's a hemodynamically significant stenosis, which you can revascularize at that point. Um, so uh, one of the stenosis, the one across the uh, diagonal, was measured at 0. This is the one across the LED, I'm assuming, was at 0. 0.76 here. And the one across the diagonal was uh, done at 0. 0.73. And so based on that, uh, stenting was done. Right. So. We put a wire across the lesion. We do a baseline me measurement. You can see what's your PDPA. You kind of get a baseline FFR, I guess, like a better word. And then you give a dentist injection, IV, to max of two minutes to the patient's tolerance or to the point where the FFR numbers are significant. So you start a dentist infusion. You run it for about two minutes in this patient, what, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, you get to get an FFR drop to the point seven five point six. But the baseline FFR or baseline pressure differential was still not, not abnormal. So that's when you run it in the infusion and determine the severity. So which trial, which two trials we must know that you got yeah, think, FFR? Um, for the next conference, <coughs> maybe one of the fellows can present yeah, FFR, I high FFR. And CFR, sure. these three things. Dr. Sean, yeah. why, why is intravenous not important? That's a very good question. I think we used to do a lot of intravenous, and I think we felt that it was not standardized enough. Um, we also felt that it was much better to, uh, ischemia prediction was much better correlated to intravenous and creative pathway. I think the intracoronary adenosine. The studies were just not linearly correlated with this thing. We just know that we had to move on from there to those three trials. A lot of cath labs around the country just need to on the way to that If you have two or three major branches, let's say your lesion is in the middle, maybe there's a big cirque that's slightly, you know, 
coming off a little distally. You have two big diagonals. The argument is made that how much adenosine is actually getting down the LED and how much is going in the other vascular bed. So if you give IV infusion, you are sort of standardizing for everything. So you started an infusion, dilated everything, and then you see with a wire what the stenosis is. Um. So, yeah, go ahead, keep on going to the next angel. Uh, how much time do you have left? Not that much. Please tell me if you want me to stop somewhere. And this is, I guess, the intervention at this point. Do you have the IVUS images there? Uh, I don't think they came in this. I don't know. I didn't know where to where we could get them. So there was a concern. There was a concern of. LED Austin disease, right? Did you all mm -hmm. notice that? Yeah, the Austin and LEO portal look very, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. very, very, very worrisome, right? Mm -hmm. So, an I was supposed to. So, let me show if the part is positive, what would the eye just make a difference in terms of? I think I was would guide us a little bit better as to which lesion, is, what is the significance of the Austin LED lesion in this? You know, you've got tight. Diagonal lesion is a tight LED lesion. And then you want you also have this borderline looking LED Austro disease. Well, maybe the FFR is low because the LED Austro is low. So the whole thing downstream is going to be at normal. Right? So you can sometimes, this is an interesting case because then IVUS is an attentive investigation. It looks at the LED Austro to see how what is the size of that. If the, LED, if the IVUS has shown the LED Austro is very, very bad to disease, then you would not do what we did. You would actually say, well, maybe this patient has LED Austro disease, I think we should put some fiber surgery. What, so about, yeah. what about a pullback with the FFR? Yeah, so we actually did that. Back Unfortunately, we didn't spend enough time doing the washout on the FFR or the adenosine infusion. So, we, so what Josh is talking about is you can actually selectively cross the lesion into the LED diagonal, do those FFRs, and then bring the wire just beyond the LED off to lesion, but proximal to those distal lesions, and do a third FFR. So we actually tried doing that, except that we didn't wait enough on the adenosine washout, so the results were not accurate. So, so you, why do you have to wait for the adenosine to wash out? I mean, so. To recalibrate. To because recalibrate. You're still, yeah, you're still running 0 0.76, 0 0.73 on the wire, which is downstream. You can just put it back. And it has to be recalibrated. We wanted to do an IVUS because I think for significance of osteo and proximal vessel virus is very important. This is a very good idea as to the disease extent. And we, could, we could see actually quite a bit of eccentric flat. But on the IVUS, you could see that the MLD, the minimal lunar diameter or area, was uh, almost 5 centimeter yeah they said 4.9 yeah 4 .9 yeah so that would be the non-significant what would be your cutoff for significant based on IVUS? so four millimeter square for a branch and <coughs> six millimeter square for left wing so Dr. Shah, if you were to use an FFR to make your decision about whether you're vascular acid but you did but you had sequential lesions so how did you use 0.73, that doesn't make sense, right? Because you had some sequential lesions, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, that's they, why you they, see they the been a paper, I mean, in chat intervention, they're talking about modeling with tandem lesions, and I was really, because it was kind of interesting. Apparently, although there is a concern of decrease you know, on, on the reliability of the, the cutoff points, it still holds. Uh, no, but the, so, the so decision was you're, you're, you're you're a very right. interesting yeah. point. So the ideal way would have been to actually go back with an FFR wire. If you're wondering if the LED Austin was sensitive, is that what you're asking? What you so you're wondering if those are on the distal lesion, right? So okay. there's LED Austin disease, then there is a mid LED disease, and there's a diagonal LED disease. Okay. So you don't have sequential lesions other than the Austin LED disease. Yeah. So once you've established Austin LED diseases. 50% of the worst based upon the IVUS data. Okay. You just go ahead and fix those and you can actually go back in 
in theory, we have to have a wire and say, well, you know what, I'm 10 seconds past about the ability of the disease. We can do it and see if that normalizes the effort of our prescription drugs. We can consider doing that. And that's an approach we often use in tandem lesion. So you fix one lesion, run the effort of wire back in to see if there is two. Yeah, say, say that again. Does the FFR, the osteo lesions? You put an FFR, the osteo lesion, correct? Yeah, so that, that's a whole another topic, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Branching points, osteo lesions, there is some limitation with FFR. Um, but again, I think you can be very selective and you try to do that. And uh, nonetheless, I think what was very interesting was the lesions which did not seem very significant in geography turned out very significant. It's a good way of you know assessing patients where either non invasive testing is not being done or you can't you have a heart activity. So if this patient had a positive stress test, would you still have a part? Yeah, I mean if in geography you do something that looks not significant, you would still like large part. area of anterior ischemia. Yeah, if it's large, I think I would probably debate. I would start the osteum. At that point you have to yeah, if, if there is a large area, I mean, I mean, they want to consider it. Well, what we have, I think the message, one of the messages for the same trial is that you uh, save the stents. Yeah. So, so I, I think that's the, that's one thing. If you can save, put less stents in a patient by measuring, I'm not going to be in the measuring, so I can, but I, I won't do that. So why, why does <laughs> FFR, so do you all know that FFR guided PCI outperforms routine PCI? That's very important. Right? Just uh, stop you and show you. And basically, that was in, in the fundamental, wherever we do a stent, we are making a stable, flat, and stable. So, FFR really makes you think really hard before you go ahead and do that. And I think that, that's where the value lies. Yeah. And a lot of, lot of the studies have shown that people were doing a lot extra stents where it was really not necessary. And I think I was. You know, I was an FFR guidance really would actually help me much more in this patient where I could feel very comfortable saying that LED osteo is not significant. And just go after the lesion with the base. I mean like in this gentleman, if he had like an eight percent defect, he has three lesions that you arguably could stent, right? So yeah. FFR helped you distinguish which or FFR and IBIS, two out of the three need to stents versus all three or just choosing one of the three and you know, right? That's right. So and, and that's what, what FFR, if you think, have you guys heard of syntax screening? So syntax basically is a, <coughs> it gives you a weight of core anatomy as to how many diseases are significant, which are not significant. When you re-stratify, re-calculate syntax after doing an FFR in all those vessels, the numbers are much lower. In other words, a lot of those lesions, which deemed, are deemed significant on angiography, are actually really not the more dynamic So FFR adds to all of those and prevents us from being unnecessary steps. All right, guys, uh, enough of FFR. Do we have any uh, slide talk or deck? Do we have, what, what were those various questions? Are they gone? <laughs> they were called? Oh, they were called. All right. So, you Josh, you have another conference right now? Yeah, we have a journal club. Journal club? Okay. Yeah. 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 We have the same thing on next Friday. Oh, we can save this case. We got to do it. We got to do it. So the article I have for you today, this is on um, arrhythmic, oh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So the article I have for you today, um, so uh, this is uh, from the Journal of Echocardiography, um, the September 2015 uh, issue, and basically looking, the focus is on the significance of left ventricular involvement in arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia and cardiomyopathy associated with it. So basically this study was done in the Netherlands and what they were looking at was to uh, take patients 
who had a suspected or confirmed uh, diagnosis of uh, ARVC and in addition to that they also looked at a group of pa a, a relatives of those patients who were found to have a positive gene mutation and comparing them with healthy controls in a prospective manner and uh, basically because in the past um, left ventricular involvement had been regarded more or less as an uh, end stage uh, uh, of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, but the key in this study was to see if there was a way that echo could be used to identify uh, subtle changes in the left ventricular function um, st uh, structurally uh, before reaching the so-called uh, end stage where they would be manifesting with a decreased uh, <coughs> left ventricular ejection fraction and uh, end stage heart failure. So uh, basically, there's a broad spectrum of uh, disease severity in ARVC. Um, sometimes it may appear to affect just the right ventricle, and then in some patients it seems to involve more of the left ventricle. And the degree of uh, left ventricular involvement is significant because it portends a more dire prognosis in these patients. It's a more unfavorable prognosis if you see left ventricular uh, involvement. And therefore, if you could detect that earlier on, you could potentially use that to risk stratify patients individually um, as far as uh, therapies later on uh, would dictate uh, your management. And also uh, in this study, they did compare with um, echocardiography the use of a cardiac MRI because um, cardiac MRI uh, can show late uh, enhancement with gadolinium and uh, myocardial fibrosis, but the key in there is that does that uh, correlate consistently with uh, your left uh, ventricular uh, wall motion abnormalities when patients get to that stage or if the echo could be used um, to detect changes even before CMR would be able to uh, show it. So again, their hypothesis in this study was that using echocardiographic uh, deformation imaging may be more sensitive than the conventional echocardiographic uh, parameters to be able to look for the left ventricular wall motion uh, abnormalities. And uh, in addition to that, they were also seeking to identify what uh, parameters from that uh, could be used uh, to identify which of this group of patients would be at a higher risk for adverse events later on, not limited to uh, sudden cardiac death and end-stage heart failure. So the study was carried out between 2006 uh, to 2008 in the Netherlands, and all the follow-up, everything uh, was completed by 2014, including all the um, data collection, um, outcomes analysis, and so forth. And as far as um, classification of patients into different groups of severity uh, with regard to ARVC, they went by the 2010 uh, task force uh, criteria. And so uh, basically, again, you had three groups of patients, those with either suspected or confirmed ARVC, those relatives or family members who did not have the clinical manifestation but who were positive for the gene mutation, and um, the group of uh, healthy controls where the controls were not related in any way um, to the patients with the clinical disease. And as far as um, outcomes, so they used a composite of multiple endpoints. So they looked at uh, sustained, uh, spontaneous sustained monomorphic VT, sudden cardiac death, uh, aborted uh, sudden cardiac death, um, patients requiring appropriate ICD intervention for a ventricular arrhythmia, and a heart transplantation. And uh, basically, if patients had multiple endpoints that they reached, um, they would use the time uh, to reach the first endpoint, and uh, events after that were in registered, but they were not included in the analysis. So the echocardiographic uh, exams, they were performed with patients at rest in the standard left lateral decubitus position, and basically um, did a complete study including uh, 2D and uh, Doppler tissue imaging, both in parasternal and uh, apical views and they did additional recordings of three conventional uh, apical views. And their focus in this case was to look especially for wall motion abnormalities. They also took care to try to avoid the right ventricle in all those views because their goal was to try to focus on the left ventricle and see if they could detect subtle changes in that. And um, 
In addition to that, um, they also measured RV function uh, by tap C, as well as RV uh, fractional area change. And then LV function was uh, measured using the Simpson uh, biplane method. So in addition to the standard imaging, they also uh, performed uh, deformation imaging. And basically, they looked at the standard 18 segments. And the way they defined it is that they looked at averaging peak strain values over the 18 segments to get a mean a peak systolic strain and basically anything that was less than negative 12.5 percent was considered to be significant. So I mean in this case they were looking at the LV as a focus and then after that for the RV well, function. The okay. mm -hmm. You have the in terms of the LV, um, is that the question? How do they separate the 18? So, I mean, as far as I'm um, using whether like uh, apical, mid, basal, the standard um, 18 segments was what they were going by for this. And then as far as the, so between the RV and LV, the RV, they were looking mostly at uh, the function. So they were using the tap C and the fractional area change. Um, in addition to that, they were also looking at other parameters, including the RVOT diameter, which actually, as will be shown later on, did um, seem to be correlating with the patients experiencing adverse events. Um, as far as the LV, that was where they were focusing on, especially as far as the strain. So not really the RV. They were looking at the LV as far as um, the uh, strain rate and whether or not it was exceeding 12.5%. Uh, percent. Because there's 18 segments mm -hmm. of LV. That's what they had specified here. Yeah, 18 LV segments. So they averaged it over 18 of those so of the segments. Do picture of those 18 segments? Uh, there should be a figure coming up later on. Okay. Mm -hmm. did, they, did they use uh, global longitudinal screen, radial screen? That also, I'll have those pictures uh, coming up as well. So, and as far as the LV, they focused even more as it was particularly also on the mid and the, the posterior lateral walls as well um, in terms of uh, quantifying the strain. So for the cardiac MRI, they were not able to get it in all of the patients, but they did get it in a subgroup of uh, 19 patients and uh, eight relatives who had undergone that as part of their uh, clinical workup, uh, performed in a 1.5 a Tesla scanner. Those were all performed within 12 months of the uh, echo uh, examinations. 12 months? Mm. Yes, uh, within 12 months of the echo. But now is not a perspective in that study. Uh, not completely. And then uh, on the MRI, they were looking to see, um, using a, a li looking for evidence of a late enhancement to identify uh, areas of, of fibrosis and to see if it would correlate. So um, basically, what they defined as uh, LV involvement was if there was LVEF less than 50% and or the presence of akinesia or dyskinesia. And again, as mentioned before, if um, there was a, p a peak strain that was less than 12.5%, that was also considered uh, to be abnormal. So, um, oh, that's so they didn't exactly specify that, but I would assume that these were patients who would have had screening done um, to make sure that they didn't have evidence of coronary artery disease or something else that would explain um, the cardiomyopathy. If you were a reviewer, would you? That. I would want to see it documented in there that these patients did undergo some kind of, uh, whether it's stress testing or angiogra angiography, I would want to see evidence that they ruled out or no coronary artery disease. So the basing part of the assessment the low motion? Right? And it might be in some of the <coughs> supplemental um, uh, tables, but at least as far as the main journal article itself. Uh, so um, basically, again, to increase uh, the potential applicability of what they were defining as LV involvement, um, they focused on abnormalities in the LV posterior lateral wall as far as whether there was correlation with the clinical outcomes. Why? So What's so special posterior lateral wall? So that actually was one a question I had. I wasn't sure about that. Why just the posterior lateral wall instead of looking at the whole LV? Because you might think that if it's in the septal, that it could be influenced if they have like RV uh, pressure overload or, but I mean, instead, why not take like, look at the, all of the RV free wall? I'm not sure why they're focusing on just the posterior lateral part of it. Okay. 
So, uh, and then statistical analysis, um, basically uh, they used a p-value significance of less than 0.05 and 95% uh, confidence interval. Um, I mean, I can go through some of it, uh, the best in statistics. Um, they use a standard like um, paired uh, t-test and the Fisher's test to um, analyze the categorical data, bivariate uh, correlations between continuous variables using Pearson's uh, a correlation coefficient. And so kind of, uh, and the pathogenic mutations, the most commonly ones that they identified were in the placophilin uh, 2 gene. And this was seen in 71% of patients with uh, ARVC and 75% uh, percent of the relatives. And uh, based on the study, all 16 relatives of patients with uh, ARVC carried the pathogenic mutation uh, but did not fulfill like the complete criteria to meet the definition of ARVC. And then the control group, uh, again, 55 healthy volunteers, no, in w no way related to the patients. So, um, let me see. so just kind of going back, th these are the baseline characteristics um, that are shown in uh, table one. So basically about evenly split, or close to evenly split between male and female, and uh, all of them uh, rel on the relatively younger side, not too surprising if you're thinking that this is someone who doesn't have coronary artery disease or otherwise um, something else to explain this uh, other than the ARVC. And then as far as um, follow-up in the study, they were going, the study went to about six years, um, plus or minus uh, two uh, for, for the study itself. And then not surprisingly, uh, based on the task force criteria, uh, major and minor, they were looking for structural RV abnormalities, repolarization abnormalities, any history of VT, ventricular arrhythmias, and a family history or positively identified uh, pathogenic mutation. Again, controlled subjects, and zero for those. And then you see anywhere from 71 to 95% in the uh, ARVC group, and then in the relatives who had positive mutations, um, they were uh, uh, 18, up to 18 percent, so not negligible. So basically, um, the patients were, all of them were in sinus rhythm uh, when the echocardiographic uh, examinations were performed, and uh, all the RV dimensions, uh, not surprisingly, were significantly increased. Um, in the patients with the ARVC, your TAPC was reduced and your RVOT diameter was increased. How big? So that I have it in here. So oh, this table, awesome. yeah, this table shows um, the difference. So in the long axis for the ARVC, it's about 19 uh, millimeters. Um, they were indexing it uh, or, or indexed for the body surface area compared to 14 for the relatives with positive mutations and the healthy control subjects. Can you make it bigger? Oh, sure. Uh, let's see. That's pretty big, huh? Okay. <coughs> I guess I can't show all of it on there. Maybe make it a little smaller. Okay. So I think in the study, uh, more than anything, what they found to be, the two most important parameters that they found was that the patients with ARVC had an enlarged uh, RVOT diameter as well as uh, reduced LVEF less than 50%. So those were the two that seemed to be most strongly correlated with those patients. ARVC and also experiencing um, the uh, composite of the adverse outcomes of either sustained monomorphic VT requirement of ICD <coughs> or sudden cardiac death and uh, heart failure. Question is, is the LV diastolic parameter? Mm -hmm. What do you think, is it dependent or independent from the RV? So, I mean, I think that that would be somewhat dependent on the RV, depending on how the... You have right side pathology, you affect the left, the left side diastolic parameter. So for example, okay. if an ASD, you do the tissue doppler, they have some abnormality, what you correct them, and fix the ASD, 
not be patiently improved those parameters. So that's not strictly independent. Right? So it's very important that the mm -hmm. LVRB interaction is mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say, you know, oh, because of that, that's a sign of LV dysfunction. Could be. But again, you know, can that have that generation? Also, because they're much older, right? Mm, this one, they were like more um, in the 40s, uh, most of the patients. Yeah, compared to 20 years old. Right, correct. I agree, 40, 40 is young already. Mm -hmm. okay. right. What else? Okay. Let's look at the LV. EF is not much different, huh? Except. Um, Maybe statistically significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was statistically significant. So this one was a, uh, uh, this is denoting p-value less than 0.01. So pretty much uh, most of the parameters here that are marked with the with this symbol, those are all p-values less than 0.01. So all of those were significant. The heart size is actually smaller. 47, 4.7, 47 versus 54, smaller heart size. So one thing I was thinking about that was if those patients had a really enlarged LV that was compressing, or a really enlarged RV that was compressing the LV, then in some patients that I'll may. The RV. So these are, yeah, these are the dimensions on the RV. Um, okay. So um, this is a table basically look is showing the percentages of, of patients with LV abnormalities uh, based on both the standard echo as well as deformation imaging. And it appears that the deformation imaging showed uh, in a higher percentage of patients, especially in the ones with ARVC, 55% uh, uh, compared to only 16% detected uh, based on conventional echo. And even in the group of uh, patients who are related with positive mutations, Detected uh, from 12 to 25 percent versus so not. What do you think? Was that the, the, how is it presented? So, uh, what would you want to? What would you? What would you ask? Regarding strength. Uh, the, yeah, for the most specific strength. The way the data is presented is binary, right? Uh, is it? Or I thought, isn't that the strain rate? So this oh, what percentage is less than 12.5 for example? Oh, okay. You'd like to know the actual values. Mm -hmm. Will they show you the Scott, Skyler, Platt, or well, I bet I bet when they did that, uh, they didn't reach anything. Because this is a, you got two this is not a perspective, perspective collective cohort. I mean, you can always criticize, why do you say, why, why minus 12.5%? Right? Yeah, and this one, this was that um, significant. You know, we could have run different level, find that one, come up with the positive. I'm not saying it's, it's not real, but. Mm -hmm. And so then, this is the representation basically of the segments um, that they were using as far as looking for uh, LV wall motion abnormalities. Oh, mm -hmm. How feasible is doing four segments of the strain? Maybe you have some experience. Oh, you know it too, right? Mm -hmm. Four with segments, especially with echo. Unless the computer, I mean, I was, I was thinking of what software they use to do the strain, because maybe that's the way that software is. Still, you're the one putting the region in region. No, no, don't you acquire, you acquire the, the four chamber, right? And yeah. then it overlays your strain on the four chamber. And then yeah. you know, you, you, you write this, that this is all post-processing. You can correct it. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Yeah, but what you're saying is how you're the one you do Then you go back and you put your region, yeah. you know, depending how big, how small location. Yeah. Four yeah. segments, eight pegas. Yeah. yeah. But they, that just may be the way the software does it. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Is, is the purpose of the study to see how first degree relatives may be screened for infected So I think the main thing that they're looking at in the study is um, not. I mean, that would be, I think, more of a secondary point they were looking at. I think the main <coughs> thing is, especially in patients who already had the diagnosis or suspicion of ARVC, that 
before they get to like uh, end stage heart failure, LV, because the thinking in the past had been if they already developed LV dysfunction at that point, they're reaching the end stage of ARVC. So before that, can they detect subclinical structural abnormalities using, in this case, deformation imaging on echo? So before the LVEF actually got to that point, and a lot of patients where it dropped, can they identify earlier parameters? Uh, not only for that, but more importantly to um, tailor their management, like in terms of a st risk stratifying them, which ones are going to be at a higher risk for more adverse events. And so basically this fig in figure two, um, so it's showing that w the deformation imaging and the CMR do correlate in the sense that regions abnormal on the CMR are seen to be abnormal on the deformation imaging, but the deformation imaging does show other areas that were not shown or seen on the late enhancement on CMR. So again, something to consider that this could be, uh, it may be a more sensitive way, at least that's you know what they're postulating. So that um, they just, uh, well, it was more. That's what I took it to be, yeah. Right, they're looking at the stra uh, strain by echo. So basically, strain by echo per cellular volume is going to be positive too. Wow. Right. And that's why I'm more sensitive. That's an actual. actual yeah. Right, he, because here this is showing that the echo detected abnormalities not only where the CMR showed late enhancement, but in additional areas as well. So they're trying to show that it may be more sensitive. So that's like adding the enhancement compared to strain mm -hmm. on echo. Right, and even in the study, well, only. Why would you do CMR fibrosis if not a skin easy to make the ACEs already? You know what I mean? Because it's very hard to do, it's very technically difficult to do strain imaging. No, no, no. This is a patient with 2D. Not that they hypokinesis and dyskinesis. Those patients, there's no point in doing CMR until you know they have fibrosis. I probably look at some patient in, with ARB, no, but without LV dysfunction. That would be the group of patients. And so the question, well, maybe they had these CMR are as part of the people who, had, people who did have ARBC. These are primarily people without it, because if you look at the visual wall motion assessment, it's almost, very few patients have wall motion abnormalities, right? I guess, uh, the, the, so if you go it's back. Not, not, not that small, right? Well, 10 to 20 percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be more with strain, though. I know, but those patients, you don't probably need to do anything so late. You already have low EF, dyskinesis, I mean, no, yeah. I know they have bad prognosis, but what do you even bother to measure straight, right? Cause I think the most important group, like Dr. Chang had said, is that if the patients who had not gotten to the point where yeah, their LVE yeah, was reduced, yeah, you can try to. Diagnosis, but LV still globally look okay, right? Those the patients probably. So people with a normal. Normal LVE. LV, yeah, you know, yeah. visually 2D, everything looks decent. You know, you have more than 50%, you know, all this dyskinesis, echinesis. Those patients are probably more likely clinically you're going to be able to get some event in a you know, relatively three to five year follow up. How, how likely, with a 20 years old relative, RVD follow them for six years, most likely you're not going to have any. Number one, they're ever going to have a disease. Number two, if you develop the disease, they might not have any, ever have health. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of them. That the yeah. imaging predicts, uh, <laughs> So, and I have that um, coming up but as I well. I want to exclude <laughs> those patients with low EF and low motion abnormality. If that predict outcome, I'll buy it. No. Well, the review, that's what I'm going to ask. Here is not, you know, this, this is not about, okay, okay this result is good or not. It's, okay, you're sitting on a review, be as harsh as possible. You know, 
So when you do your study, whatever study you do, you can think ahead, okay, what question they might ask. They're gonna all come with some other question anyway. So, <laughs> so you, you know. But I think that's <coughs> show me that stream predicts outcomes or events better mm -hmm. than and the other uh, more independent of it. And the other thing, too, is to keep in mind, CMR was only done in 19 patients in the study, and that was just part of the workup. So it wasn't even done in all the patients. So you can't really compare, you know, make any definite conclusions with that. Uh, but just something to think about. Um, just added it because it's CMR. <laughs> and then... They wanted to get it. They, were, yeah. <laughs> they wanted to get it before a reviewer asked for it. <laughs> Could be. So, and this uh, figure is basically showing a 16-year-old male um, with diagnosis of ARVC and left ventricular abnormalities that are uh, noted in the lateral, really in the <coughs> lateral wall in uh, panel B, um, compared to relatively normal strain along the septal wall in uh, panel A. And then panel C is basically showing um, the delayed enhancement uh, on a CMR. Okay. So um, I can I guess. Do you want me to skip past this? Or? So they were relating, oh, okay. yeah, to clinic related clinical mm -hmm. outcome. Okay. I cool. can. Do you want me to move I'm on? I'm gonna look at this real quick. So okay. what predict outcome? Yeah. Do. RBLT dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, so all you have to do is measure RBLT dimension. And also, or this. So what Those is were the two things. That's a good question. Major, what is MACE for someone with ARVD? Death? Uh, arrhythmic event. A particular arrhythmic event. Uh, arrhythmia. So, uh, yeah. I, I mean, in this study, they so define. You're telling me, you're telling me 40 percent. So you almost are in a mallet. 40 percent versus 11 percent is non-significant. And what's the reason? Right? There are errors. They need more patients. EF 30% versus 0% is not significant. So, is there a case of ARVD, like, why does strain on the LV? So, the reason they're doing strain on the LV, you already know that the RV is involved. These are patients with ARVC, so you know the RV is affected. So, what they're trying to see is patient, if they can identify subtler changes earlier on using echo, uh, as far as you know, adverse changes in the LV. Uh, because those are the patients that are at higher risk for worse outcomes. Like it has been shown in studies that patients with ARVC and left ventricular involvement have a more adverse prognosis compared to those without uh, overt left ventricular involvement. So they're trying to basically risk stratify those patients, at least um, earlier on, and this is one way that they were looking at to try to achieve that. And this is uh, basically um, the clinical course. So uh, the first table showing uh, based on LV ejection fraction and patients with LV if less than 50 percent, um, significantly significant decrease uh, in survival. Even though the numbers are not big, but uh, overall decreased uh, survival p value less than 0.01. Um, and then this uh, panel on the right uh, <coughs> showing uh, correlation. Uh, or at least it seems to be positively correlated with the, the deformation imaging. So EF predictive or not predictive? It appeared to be predictive. So the Look LVEF. The table. Look at the table. But that's not. They, so this this table. They didn't report it right because they're they're doing the appropriate analysis below, right? They're doing log rank tests, but that p value is probably just um, categorical. Uh, categorical. That's probably a chi square test. So that doesn't take. So this is a good example of why in longitudinal data, your time you contribute. The time that you contribute to the risk step matters yeah. because it's positive below exactly. that. It's not possible. Yeah. So basically, well, the two things that they found in the study that appear to be most correlated were the RVOT diameter and the LV. But not, but yeah. None of the analysis are adjusted. They, they have well. multi variable. Yeah, I don't know what you adjust. Okay, you, you know. Yeah. Adjust the only variable. variables. You can adjust your how many outcomes. I don't know how many outcomes they have. Very few. They have about 20 something. Outcomes of 38 patients. So, and part of the other thing they were looking at echo too, although this is a more minor point, is because a lot of the patients do have um, d ICDs in place, and uh, which is not necessarily readily available to everyone. And based on if you have MRI compatible versus not, some patients they may not be able to get that done. So echo would 
also be beneficial for that reason. But more than anything, the number one thing they were looking at is to risk stratify, identify those high risk patients before they get to, you know, um, the uh, LV, EF, uh, or um, left sided heart failure. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, basically the conclusion of this study, you still, I think you need more patients in future studies to validate this and see if it is indeed a method, deformation imaging, if it's a method that can be used. But I think it does raise an interesting point. It's, it's